I want you to know that no matter where you're coming from, you can find something to draw strings from. Yeah. Oh, that is wonderful. So that's important. Hi, my name is Raquel Baldelamar and welcome to the mega podcast where I speak with high achievers on how they fulfill their professional dreams while bringing balance throughout their lives. Today, I am with Dr. Sarah Nazarzadeh, a globally renowned author, speaker, and relationship therapist. With a PhD in social psychology and a specialization in the fields of human sexuality and relationships, Dr. Sarah has worked with thousands of individuals, couples, and organizational clients to enhance relational health and a sense of thriving at the, both the macro and micro levels. She is a sought after cultural advisor, speaker, and expert facilitator at high profile events hosted by government organizations, UN agencies, academic institutions, and Fortune 500 companies. Her latest book, Love by Design, Six Ingredients to Build a Lifetime of Love is the result of her two decade long research on the status of thriving relationships and its key ingredients, namely attraction, respect, trust, shared vision, compassion, and loving behaviors. Her parents grew up speaking different languages and followed different cultural rituals, so she grew up in an intercultural interfaith household in Tehran. Her mother was a social scientist and her dad was a social worker. She's been married for 23 years to Dr. Pejman Azarmina, a medical doctor and researcher who founded Thinkocrats. Dr. Sara is based in Los Angeles and has been to 41 countries. Her interest is in helping people move past a more superficial love to the type of love that is more lasting, more real, and more desirable. Not by chance, but by design. Dr. Sara, welcome to the Mega Podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. One of the things that I really felt connected to you when I was researching, um, reading your book and researching you is, is your background growing up in a intercultural interfaith household in Tehran, living in another country, growing up in another country for many years. Uh, like yourself, I also grew up in a uh, intercultural interfaith household in Bolivia, mm -hmm. grew up and spent, spent the first years of my life in Bolivia. So I really, and that shaped me, you know, it shaped me in a very big ways. How did growing up in that environment and that intercultural cross-faith household in Tehran. How did that shape you, you think? Well, I'm glad that I'm in a conversation with somebody who kind of identifies with that part yeah. of me. The way that it shaped me, looking back, knowing what I know now, back then, obviously, you're just growing up. This mm -hmm. is my mom, my dad, mm -hmm. how things are done. But um, in the household, we had to find out who was telling what to us, what is the practice that we had to abide by. Mm -hmm. So very early on, we learned about who is us, who are the others, who is me, who is you, mm -hmm. and uh, who I want to identify with, why, how much. And um, there's a lot going into that. But also as a child, just going back to that time, as much as I can remember as a child, I had to make sense of a lot of things, like the concept of self, the concept of the other, who is the other, right? So these are the things that we had to navigate yeah. in that. And as a child, I mean, as you're trying to comp make sense of all this, what did you think of the other as a young child? Um, for example, for example, my sister's name is Hana. Mm -hmm. That was influenced by my father's culture. My name is Sarah influenced by my mother's mm -hmm. culture. And then my brother's name came from my father's side. And then my youngest sister's name came from my mother's side. So even within the family mm -hmm. system, if you go through the names, you will see the influence of that interculturality. Yeah. Right. So um, by nature, as humans, we would like to know what is wrong, what is right what to be attracted to, what to run from, right. to preserve safety, to create connection, all of that. So if you really bring that into this context, you will see that there are so many nuances that you have to navigate as a child. Mm -hmm. So when you say the other, this is only the family system and we are not even mm -hmm. talking about post-revolution Iran. Mm -hmm. That's that, you know, right. within the family, we abide by certain rules, we look a certain way, we talk a certain way, we had 
specific rituals we could never share to the outside world right. because that could cost your life right. basically so these were the things that you know very early on i learned about the concept of self the other the others right and how to make peace with people how to uh, be in harmony with people who have such different values than you might possess you talk about that how about you You grew up in a context of having inner home values and then the outer values mm-hmm. were many times not aligned and yes. how that creates such tension and then going trying to make sense of what is right and what is wrong what mm-hmm. is good and what is bad how did you try to reconcile that but what you were being taught at home as strong values but then you go out into the outside world and then it's totally in conflict of what you're being taught at home uh, how much time do we have <laughs> i know right <laughs> Because there's so many different examples. I have to actually give credit to my parents a lot mm. because one thing that they did beautifully was to instill a very strong sense of self into us. Each of us individually were seen, recognized mm-hmm. for what we brought to the table, for uh, who we were, what we could achieve or not based on our own intellectual and physical abilities mm. that uh, we possessed. And I think with that, wherever that we went, whatever context that we went, even to this day that I go, I walk into so many spaces that if I tell you, sometimes I feel like it's a dream that I'm living. Like from a church, underground church in Peru to a high level member of a state situation at the United Nations to my practice as a sex therapist. Mm-hmm. So when you really look at different settings that you um, go into, the common denominator is me, multiple identities that I possess, right? So when you have a very strong sense of self, I think that carries you through. It does. And you are very lucky. You say you your parents helped you yes. develop that sense of self. They were both social scientists. Um, I remember reading your dad was one of the pioneers in HIV research. Yes, yes. How did that affect your... Um, your choice in terms of pursuing a career? Do you think they influenced you greatly in, in that respect? Oh, big time. Really? <laughs> big time, big time. So two things that I was thinking how they influenced us, obviously I can't remember everything because mm-hmm. it's in every dinner, t- the dinner table conversation that we had. Every, um, w- with my father, for example, every weekend we went for um, mountain climbing, which is, equivalent to hiking here it's mm-hmm. not too rigorous but like yeah. a, we lived by the mountain in uh, Tehran so every weekend we went to a mountain climbing I learned so much just by him talking and observing like for example one of the biggest lessons he taught us one day I remember there's a beautiful river uh, coming down the mm-hmm. that mountain Darban mm-hmm. and he just looked at it and said look at those rocks In life, the water doesn't stop because it can't move the rock. Sometimes you have to be the water. Just go around oh, it. That's so beautiful. That saved my life yeah. in so many situations. Yeah, the wisdom of that is so beautiful. Yeah. What do you suggest to people to, to who, who want to create that sense of self, but they don't, maybe they didn't have that experience growing up mm-hmm. and having that relationship with their parents? Because I agree with you. I think... Um, Even if it's one parent, if they can help instill a really strong sense of self in you, that is enough. If it's both parents, great. But when you grow up in a household where maybe that's not important or developing that sense of identity is not important, how can you as a young adult or mm-hmm. as a older adult try to develop that on your own? That's a great question. May I just say something in parenthesis before yeah. we move on? You know, many years ago when I went to counseling school in England to be interviewed, they asked me a question. They said, what were the traumas in your life that you experienced? And what are the heartbreaks that you endured in your life? And um, what are you going to offer your clients? And, you know, those mm-hmm. were the questions. And in honest, in utter honesty, My answer was, look, there are traumas that I experienced that people don't need to experience to build a sense of resilience. For example, our home was bombed, yeah. you know, so there are yeah. traumas that I went through. Yes, I had a solid foundation as a family, but, you but also, we all have. You were yeah, living in a war zone. Exactly. Yeah. So we had different scenarios, different traumas, right? Yeah. So I'm 
telling people this because I want you to know that no matter where you're coming from, you can find something to draw strengths from. Yeah. Oh, that is wonderful. So that's important. Yeah. That's one. The yeah. other thing is, my answer in that interview was, I know how good looks like. Let me do it. Let me show people mm -hmm. that, um, you know, not all parents are broken. Mm -hmm. They do their best. I do my best. God knows, God knows, you know, for my own mm -hmm. child. But um, we don't get it always right. Majority of times, if we look back, we regret what I you yeah. know, did what I said, yeah. but we do our best, but also there is a way that we could share with this collective wisdom so that we get people out of rot and this victimhood yeah. and instill a sense of resiliency in them to be able to acknowledge various identities that they have. And then going back to your question, how to have that balance, mm -hmm. you need to first find that balance inside multiple selves that you hold. Do they align with each other? Do they complement? Do they fight? How do they serve each other? Yeah. And then bring that balance to the world and then expect the world to offer you things that you can strengthen those sense that, you know, senses that you bring. And that's what you say about it, focusing on the strengths that you have, that you've mm -hmm. acquired, whatever they are, because everyone has trauma. People who can, who've grown up in great two household Parent, you know, mm -hmm. parents where they didn't get divorced had other forms of trauma, like what you're talking about. You grew up in a war zone for years. So uh, from what I'm hearing from you is that is that to develop that sense of self is that focus on the resiliency, the strengths, the things that you do have and don't fall into this victimhood of just feeling sorry for yourself. Because I do see that and people say, oh, there's no way I can develop a sense of self because my parents divorced and they were horrible people or they weren't the best parents. But then they were like, there's maybe there's things that about them that were difficult, but there was look at the things that really were great about them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a really great approach to to doing this. Your father nicknamed you the little black fish. Can you talk about what that what that where that comes from? Well, the little black fish is a story, children's story, mm -hmm. but it's like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Shel uh, Silverstein. So, Shel Silverstein, yes. yes. Oh, yes. So, He's a, he wrote amazing, amazing, amazing book, stories. Yes. Right? So it's children's book, but oh, not really, oh, my goodness, right? Yeah. So it's existential, it's philosophical, yeah. it changes your epistemology mm -hmm. throughout life. So that was that, The Little Black Fish by Samad Behrangi. My father called me that for as long as I remember. And then I was old enough to read the book myself. The first thing I noticed when I read the book in English was that in Farsi, we don't have a third um, pronoun as uh, like, we don't say he or she for everything. It's not gendered, it's not the gendered language. Okay. So the first time I read the book and I wanted to share it with my own child to see if this resonates with him, um, I was so disappointed because it was translated as he. And I always thought it was a she. <laughs> so that was the first thing that jumped at me, talking yeah. about different cultures, yeah. different languages, yeah. different perceptions that we have. So that was that. So the reason he called me uh, the little black fish was my questions. I always had a zillion questions. Now that I'm a mother, I understand how rewarding it is and how exhausting it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had questions about everything. So he always told me this little blackfish story. So basically, this story goes like mm -hmm. this. There's this little blackfish living in a pond. And uh, he hears or she hears these stories that uh, are told about the river, the sea, the ocean. So he's thinking maybe there's more into this world than just this pond. I want to get out. I want to see what is out there. The mother is scared and says, don't go. You should never think about that. And all the people, people, I mean, animals, fish in the pond, try to eliminate people like turtle and whatnot who bring those stories to keep everything right. peaceful and contained. But um, the little black fish has the information. So one day she goes to the mother and says, I'm leaving. And she does. After crying and stuff, she leaves. She meets a lot of um, wise creatures along the way collects wisdom as she goes. And as she is going towards the end, to the river, to the sea, learning that, oh my God, expansion, expansion, there's more, there's more. 
towards the end, um, to rescue a bunch of fish, uh, she loses her own life. So I'm not sure how dramatic I'm going to be with my <laughs> life, but that gave me strength yeah. not to be scared, think outside the box. And also I'm addicted to collecting wisdom, addicted, because I believe that um, the wisdom is not generated, it's there. Yeah, you're... it's just that we have to collect mm -hmm. it's and inside abide you. by them. Yeah. Well, that little black fish has been to forty-one countries now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you've been gaining wisdom and also sharing wisdom along this route. Yes, I've been privileged. Talk about your journey to becoming a therapist. Now you got your PhD in sociology. You. Um, then went on to California to get another master's degree yeah. uh, in counseling. And you've done a research methodology with about 300 subjects, mm -hmm. right, um, to make observations in, of, of your studies. I mean, you have your, your credentials are just enormous. How have you balanced all of that with also trying to be a mother a wife also take your own personal health and, and mm -hmm. make that a priority. I mean, that is very, very challenging. Um, but let's just like, let's, as we break this, this down, because that's, that's what I've always been very interested in is in people who are able to do many things. And that's partly, that's the wisdom too, that we cultivate is in being able to do many things that are important to us well. So first is just your career. You, just tell me about the journey of your career and and kind of where you, what got you to where you are here today? Sure. So I always knew that I want to better the lives of people. When I was four, I decided that I'm going to be a gynecologist. My <laughs> logic <laughs> was that the moment that we invite a new human to the world, mm -hmm. If I make it pleasant with my four-year-old mind, if I make it pleasant, then that person is going to have a better life, mm -hmm. is going to pass it on to other people. Then around age uh, 16, 17, so I, I thought that I went full on uh, yeah. as I do with things. So studying and uh, subscribing to medical journals, even people who are listening, I'm not a faker. But I made an agreement with a friend who was a medical student at Tehran University to fake an ID so I could go <laughs> sit at their classes. I would skip school to go sit at their classes. I find it so funny that you wanted to go be a gynecologist, yet I also read that you didn't believe in weddings. You didn't believe, you didn't want to go to weddings because you <laughs> saw the 50% failure rate of marriages and you're like, I'm not going to go to weddings when there's a 50% failure rate. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> that seemed too dangerous to me. <laughs> seemed too dangerous to me. I honestly, like, you know, if you look at my pictures at, taken during that time mm -hmm. in any weddings that I had to be in, mm -hmm. like a cousin or something, mm -hmm. I look like this. <laughs> I'm why? like, I know where this is going. 50%, <laughs> yeah. Why are people doing this? Yeah. So then little by little, I learned that, well, my father, wise father, mm -hmm. sat me down and said, Sarah, are you sure you don't, you want to be a medical doctor? I said, yes, absolutely. This is where I want to be. And he said, look, um, the, here are the priorities that mm -hmm. you share with me, that you want to have kids, mm -hmm. you want to have a family. No. If you are a gynecologist, especially if you practice obstetrician on the side of it, then you are being uh, woken up by the babies coming yeah. to world and stuff. So anyway, he changed my mind. So I went to study linguistics okay. because then that would be my way to rescue the world because then I was going to help people um, communicate better. Therefore, the world is going to be more peaceful. Mm. So that was that for a while. So I studied linguistics. And then along the way, I realized that because I was a representative of the university and, you know, had the journal at the university, all that, I kept receiving questions from people. And I realized that the questions are not about linguistics or communication. The questions are about how do I relate with other people? How do I, yeah, mainly relationships. And then obviously, you know, um, back then in Iran, this is like 20 something years ago, um, sexuality was not a topic that was talked about. Um, 
I thought it was only in Iran. And then as I started going to any country in the world, including our beloved country here in the U.S., I realized that this is a taboo. Mm -hmm. It's very sensationalized. But when it comes to the actual matter of fact speaking, people are just whispering right, right. or pathologizing. Or So I said, okay, so this is the place to be. Nobody's doing it. I'm doing it. So I went to England to be educated as a um, psychosexual therapist, couples counselor. So that's the clinical side. And then I realized that I need to learn systematically how to educate people. So I did a lot in sexuality education. But then when it came to my PhD, I realized that I also would like to be evidence informed. I can't just say, well, this is what I saw in my workshops or clients. Mm -hmm. So I did research methodology to be solid in how I interpret mm -hmm. and um, generalize the information and wisdom that I'm collecting. So that was the reason behind that. Along those lines, all of these years, I'm working for the UN, United Nations, doing different missions for them from facilitating meetings to going to um, negotiate access for you know different groups. Um, so that is going on the side. And then for my PhD, I decided that I'm going to work with people who are underrepresented in research. And um, the topic of my research was the health seeking information of hard to reach adolescents. Mm -hmm. And I put hard to reach in quotations and somebody actually commented, uh, you don't need a quotation. Is it because your English is not very good? I said, no, actually, this is very intentional. I don't do anything without intention. It's because nobody is hard to reach. If you fail to reach people, it's on you. Mm. So then I studied motivation uh, models, human motivation model, human uh, behavioral model. That's the so social psychology part mm -hmm. of it. And then all of that came together this is while I'm living in England and, you know, that. And then we moved to the U.S. My clinical degrees didn't apply here. So I started just doing consulting. And the difference between, you know, consulting and therapy is with psychotherapy, you need pathology. You need to diagnose people. You need to, you know. But with coaching and consulting, you're more future focused. Mm -hmm. um, it's short lived, future focused and more contextual based. So I kept doing that in the U.S., while doing other works with different organizations. And uh, and then I was invited to be the president of the Division 7 for California Psychological Association to revive their chapter on diversity and social justice. Um, and it's really interesting. One time I have to tell you this, uh, Raquel. So I was invited to do this uh, facilitation for a very high level um, leadership meeting in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., political meeting. So the facilitation is going very well and people are really arguing, big egos in the room. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing that relational space, right? And then it's the bathroom break. In the bathroom, a lady comes to me, one of the participants, and says, I've got to ask. <laughs> I said, what is happening? <laughs> she said, I Googled you. Are you a sexologist? Are you, <laughs> what are you? What are you doing here talking about this political thing? I said, look, the same people who are around the room, the same selves that show up in the bedroom, yeah. they show up in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. What is the difference? Yes. And you know, and she was convinced. Yes, I love that. It's a relational space, right? It is, it is. And you know, the, a lot of the skills that you teach couples as a sex therapist, applies also in the boardroom it's yeah. different and it's maybe not as nuanced it's not maybe it's not as uh you know you have to have restraint in certain areas but it is very it's, it's about relationships and relations mm -hmm. um i you've been you've said you've been called a doctor a therapist professor yes. consultant counselor coach psychosexual therapist couples therapist many other terms besides of context you have like a lot of roles, mm -hmm. which is, is a beautiful thing. How do you, do you sometimes get confused of what those roles are? Or do you just kind of, cause, cause when you're, when you professionally, when you have all these multiple roles and multiple jobs, essentially as a, you know, advising the UN, you know, advising UN, advising leaders, advising couples, it is kind of a different role you have to carry. And sometimes there can be confusion inside mm -hmm. of that. How do you try to, 
balance that within yourself? Um, I learned the difference between identities, mm -hmm. roles, and the transitions that are needed between them. Oh, yes. So that helped a lot. That's so true. What So describe, what is your process for doing the transitioning? Because I agree with that. That's really important. Sure. So for example, I give you a, an example that many people out there could relate to. Like, for example, during the pandemic, a lot of people had issues because I'm doing a high level. Let's say, for example, I'm a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I'm solving a case. I'm involved in this, you know, scenario, mm -hmm. confidential, mm -hmm. and nah. And then two minutes later, I'm leaving to cook dinner. Mm -hmm. And then my child comes and I should immediately become the mother mm -hmm. or the parent mm -hmm. figure, right? So it's a lot of people were exhausted because of that, because they didn't have a chance to transition. Yeah. What is the expectation? What is the energy mind space that is needed from one role to the other? So I share an exercise that is actually freely available on the website of Love by Design. It's called Roles and Goals. All of my clients have to do it once a year, at least once a year, mm -hmm. to make sure that the roles that they want in their lives are very much specified for them. The resources, mind space, energy, uh, attention, and money, mm -hmm. and in general resources mm -hmm. that are needed for each of those roles are in place and then have a strategy for each of those roles that they could check the box at the end of the year. That helps a lot. And another way that I do the transition, if I may show you actually somatically, mm -hmm. is I check with myself, who am I, where am I, what am I doing, right? Let's say, for example, from this, from this conversation mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. I'm going to leave to the airport. And it's going to be a totally different scenario for me after this, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I do, as soon as I sit in that airplane chair, I have a check-in with myself. What am I leaving behind? What am I carrying mm -hmm. forward? To be able Love to be that. present for the role that is coming after this, yeah. right? In this way, I do the transition for myself. Sometimes I ask people to do this based on their sensory modes like let's say mm -hmm. for example there's a cer certain perfume that is preserved for a certain role mm -hmm. there's a certain clothing that we wear to prepare for a certain role uh, so these are the things that your know, transitions between roles are extremely important if yeah. you have multiple roles oh, which yeah. many of us many do many of us do and it's so challenging handling just one role but then having to navigate between one role and another is yeah is so interesting i love what you say dr sarah about just checking in with yourself to say what role am i going into right now and do you find do you do a meditation practice as part of that do you how do you start like this the day as you're trying to establish like the roles you're having to play that mm -hmm. day do you do something to prepare yourself for the multiple roles you you have to do. I mean, for myself, like I have to, it's it's a meditation practice for me. That's what really helps me prepare myself for the different roles I have to I have to mm -hmm. play for that day, or, you know, the month. But how would you just say you kind of try to align yourself so that you're ready to handle where those multiple roles? Right. I'm actually very curious to hear about your meditative like a state, like what is your it's practice? My, it's I wake up every single morning. I have a, uh, it's a, what I call a transcendental meditation. Mm -hmm. And it's a prayer that I developed, you know, over many years. And that prayer, um, it's like a long prayer and it takes on like a different meaning based on what I do. And before I even do that prayer, I just basically think of like, I just ask myself, how am I feeling this day? What am I, what are just kind of, connecting with the universe, connecting with what um, my thoughts, the universe. And then once it's kind of all settled, then I do my prayer. And that prayer will take on a different form in every single, every single, whatever it's happening in my life, what challenges I'm facing. And once that prayer is done, you know, that I, I can, I think, go off with my day. I st usually start, if it's a weekday, I start with my, with my work day, my my role of like a business owner, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a weekend, I take on, you know, it's a different role. I'll maybe go on a long run. I'll go to the farmer's market. I'll do more other things that just nourish my soul in that way. But it really, it, I always find that when I start my day with a meditation, it, it changes everything. It gives me such a level of equanimity mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that really nothing else can. And that it prepares me to navigate the many different roles 
I have to also wear. Mm -hmm. So it is, I, I find it really interesting what other people do, what they do to just mentally prepare themselves uh, for the challenges that they're, you know, to, that they're going to face that day for right. all the different roles that they have to do. So what I'm hearing from you is uh, what we know of research also. You're bringing your energy level, you're prepping yourself mm -hmm. to meet the demands of the day throughout mm -hmm. your meditation. Mm -hmm. And um, where the attention goes, energy flows, mm -hmm. right? So that's important um, practice that you do the TM with. One of the things that I find work for me is I started defining certain things that I call essences in the book. Essence. Um, essences are the ones that are never changing, ever. They are with me until I die. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones that I remind myself every day. For example, uh, when I'm meditating, I meditate into how would I show up as I just go through my words. So let's say, for example, grace kindness or integrity, um, consistency, whatever that is for me, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, it doesn't matter what role I'm in, those are with me. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that are only for certain roles. So for example, if I'm going to visit a relative that is sick and I know that I really don't have the gut, I'm going to be traumatized or activated around them. I, on that day, I try to meditate to compassion, mm -hmm. patience, I'm right. trying to invite more of what I need in I that see. day. Yeah. Um, or for the relationships that are surrounding me, especially my romantic relationship with Pejman, as you mentioned, my husband, um, based on the six ingredients that are solid research based, I think about so which one of these ingredients I need today. I need to sprinkle mm -hmm. a little bit more of this today, maybe mm -hmm. a little more respect, maybe mm -hmm. a little more manifestation of love. What do I need today? to make this soup a delicious one mm -hmm. for the relationship. I love that. I love that, just how you actually focus on on that. Let's let's get to talking about the book, the, uh, <laughs> the six, those six ingredients, which uh, sure. I, I, I just love. And these are the six ingredients that you need that uh, uh, Dr. Sarah said that you need here in the book, love by design. It's attraction, respect, trust compassion, shared vision, and loving behaviors. Mm -hmm. And what I also really appreciate is that a lot of these these things, when you meditate on this, it's like you can do this for both your romantic relationship. You, I mean, obviously you wrote this for a romantic relationship, yes. but really you can also apply it to any relationship. Like let's say your 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 fam sick family relative mm -hmm. or a work a work colleague it's obviously different degrees mm -hmm. but if you but but i just also i really appreciate that because it changes your framework in terms of just um when you can apply these six these six ingredients it changes it's it changes your whole life in terms of your outlook and your and the energy that you that energy you put out absolutely changes in every in every realm mm -hmm. absolutely so let's just go let's talk first with like personal relationships, mm -hmm. okay? Because I know business relationships can be very different in, 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 in these. Attraction. Why do you want to be around a person? Why do you want to apply for a certain company versus mm -hmm. the other? Mm -hmm. It's actually very similar. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the way that is described and practiced within um, different relationships could be different. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for example, there are certain principles that are that apply to any relationship, mm -hmm. like uh, reciprocity of liking, for mm -hmm. example. This principle talks about if I come to you and you know that I like you, over a period of time, you like me, mm -hmm. you like me back. Mm -hmm. We're human, right? From that moment that we look into the eyes of our caregiver and they look to us as, I like you, mm -hmm. you should be here. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you made it to this world, you know? Yeah. So. That brings that piece of um, tranquility yeah. and safety, and uh, it's a human connection too. It's wrecking the attraction. It goes back to just like we're humans, even if it's mm -hmm. attraction at it, just almost like to a stranger. Yes, we're humans connected in this world, trying to just make a small difference. Yes. So I just I think that's really 
beautiful too. The attraction isn't always about your romantic partner. You know, it can be something kind you do for mm -hmm. a stranger. Exactly. So why do you want to be around another person mm -hmm. or another, like, you know, entity? Mm -hmm. So that's attraction, mm -hmm. right? And then the problem is when it comes to romantic relationships, when, when I say attraction, people immediately go to sexual attraction. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's only one. We have social attraction, intellectual attraction, mm -hmm. financial attraction, uh, political attraction. We have so many different types of attraction and attraction grows with us through time. Mm -hmm. So what I would love for people to take away from this definition of attraction is expand your minds and be honest. What do you want to be around? And it's not only value-based, but also based on what your default is, what you're coming from. So for example, if I've seen my parents who talk about their emotions, that's my default. If I'm around somebody who's closed down and they can't really talk about their emotions, that's unnatural to me. Mm -hmm. I'm either driven towards it, depending on how much I love that default, or I will run away as fast as I can from it. So with attraction, we need to know what is the blueprint that we are carrying around attraction? What is it that we want to be around? What is it mm -hmm. that we are um, running away from? Mm -hmm. These two polarities dictates where you end up. What you're attracted to. Yes, and yeah. what you want to be around. Like my clients who come and say that, I always choose the wrong person, mm -hmm. or I always choose the wrong job. You know? Yeah. So that comes yeah. from, you know, there are traces. Of, where are they, go. what are they, why are they attracting that? Why are they going for that? Mm -hmm. Respect. Respect is the initial entry point to anything I do from any community that I go to for the humanitarian work mm -hmm. to my clients, to anything. I have everybody as high, at highest respect. And that is what we don't see in the world right now. And that's why such a chaos, because my way is the way. How dare mm -hmm. you say that your way is the way? I have zero respect, right? Um, we can go into that a lot, but in romantic relationships and high stake relationships specifically, it's important for people to define respect for themselves. Respect is, I am able to hold my boundaries lovingly and firmly, and then use them as invitations to bring you into my life, to my world, to my sphere, and guiding you with those boundaries. A lot of people, the way that they talk about boundaries these days, they're like borders, mm -hmm. like keep away, or this thing that I call acquired narcissism, because they're not able to hold their boundaries, they become passive aggressive, or they go, 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 give, 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 and they even walk all over themselves, let mm -hmm. alone, you know, other people around them. Mm -hmm. So respect, to be respected, you need to be respectful, you need to be respectable, all of these things that are nuanced yeah. that we need to pay attention to. And respecting other opinions, respecting differences that are not your own, mm -hmm. while also staying true to your own value mm -hmm. system as well. Exactly. So actually, this is really another area. Talking about macro and micro level, mm -hmm. right? So yes, I work with couples, but also I consult on diversity, equity, inclusion, and engagement. How does that work? Mm -hmm. If I'm attracted to you and then... My subconscious wish is that I'm going to make you like me. I'm going to make you fit into my desires and my life. So I'm, I'm closing down all the doors that make you diverse and beautiful mm -hmm. and wonderful and exciting. Mm -hmm. Over a period of time, then I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Because there's nothing left of you. Right. Right? You, they've just, you've just molded them to exactly what you want, but not what make, makes them Exactly. Unique. And that's the cultural issue with many organizations who are really suffering to make diversity, equity, and inclusion a part of their DNA of the company. Because you bring people on board. Mm -hmm. In the hiring process, you eliminate anybody who is different because they're not aligned with our culture, mm -hmm. right? So we kill the diversity. And then from the pool that we have, homogenous pool that we have, we are trying to create diversity, mm -hmm. turning on the volume of that. I mean, how is that going to work? Yeah. I just love your your ability to navigate both just these these very large organizational challenges at a very macro level, Dr. Sarah, to 
the most micro, most intimate relationships. I mean, it really is. So it's just wonderful that you have that ability to do that. And it just, it takes such balance and it's such, it's, it's very similar to skills, but it's like just solving very different problems. But then at the, at the end, it's the core is these things, these, these, these six things you talk about. Yeah. At the core is relationships, human mm -hmm. relationships. Trust. Trust, two words, reliability and consistency, people. Mm -hmm. That's important mm -hmm. because you could be trustworthy in so many different ways, but if you're not consistent, it doesn't matter. That one night that you didn't lock the door and the burglars came in, you broke my trust, mm -hmm. right? It yeah. doesn't matter if you did that for 26 years. And I'm not saying that we need to be superhumans. We can drop the ball. That's okay. But if you do that, admit it with integrity. Mm -hmm. Go and try to mend it. Try to do better. So that is the piece about re, um, trust. Again, when we say trust in couple them, immediate place that people go is what? Affair. Affairs, yes. Exactly, yeah, right? Yeah. Which is actually not majority of people that I see. It's more like a social trust financial trust or mistrust or breach of trust, right? Mm -hmm. So there are so many different types of trust that are shaped or broken within a partnership. And these are the things that we need to really pay attention to. Do you think that a couple should have like an established, these are the things that are important to me from a trust level, I mean, beyond like something like the base, like affairs and things like that, establishing what are those value systems that are important to each other from a trust level? Yes. And if I may, there's an exercise in the book that I call quirks, sensitivities, and pet peeves. Oh, yeah. There's a whole chapter on what we bring mm -hmm. to the relationship mm -hmm. and love. Mm -hmm. If you know that about yourself and know that trust is one of your sensitivities, so quirks are the ones that make us cute yeah. and make us us and you know identifiable yeah. to others. And sometimes they become pet peeves for other people, yeah. but we're not aware of them. Pet peeves are, are the ones that disgust us mm -hmm. on a daily basis mm -hmm. or, you know, when we see them. For me, it's people who chew with their mouth open, oh. you know, <laughs> so I, I totally get those are those are just pet peeves, you know, and it's like I, I tell my boyfriend, I'm like, when, sometimes he's like not thinking, he's just like starts chewing with his mouth open. I'm like, honey, chew with your mouth closed, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so. Can I offer something there? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's so common. <laughs> when you have something in the relationship uh -huh. like that, can you please, in a moment that he's not doing it, uh -huh. you're going for a walk, hike, uh -huh. you know, whatever uh -huh. that your thing is, and say, you know what, I just wanted to bring up something. Uh, I'm going to give you two, you're going to give me two, okay? Uh -huh. And not more than two, just keep it light. I love that. Right? And you know, sometimes when you don't pay attention and when you chew with your mouth open, yeah. it's 10 out of 10 for me. <laughs> I love that, Dr. Sara. It's oh, so important. Oh, that is so, so good. That is so, so good. Because I know when I've like, we're at the, I'm making, you know, I have dinner and he's like enjoying my meal. And, you know, he's just like all of a sudden starts chewing with his mouth open. I just say, I look at him or he, and he gets, he gets offended, you yeah. know, and then it's just, I, I'm the nag. So I have mm -hmm. to, uh, I love what you say, change it take it out of that context and just say two out of two. We're going to, I'm going to do two. And then he does two. Is that kind of how it is? Yeah. You just go for a walk uh -huh. and talk about it. I love it. And uh, <laughs> we can it. talk about why the science behind walking, if mm -hmm. people's bodies allow, that's just because of bilateral stimulation yeah. and also regulation. Yeah. But also a lot of my couples, when I see them individually, they tell me stuff well, I'm, you know, she does this all the time. Uh -huh. I'm like, did you tell her 100 times? I'm like, can you try it in the session? And then they come, they're so uncomfortable because uh -huh. they don't want to offend the other person. Yeah, yeah. They're like, you know what? When you do this, it's really, I'm like, no, this is actually 10 out of 10 for him. Did you know that? <laughs> and yeah. usually they say, you know, he, she, you know, whoever that the partner yeah. is, they're like, I didn't know this bothers you this much. Mm -hmm. We are not like people who are... Mm, there to, you know, like get our partners. We mm -hmm. are there to make their lives easier mm -hmm. for the most part. Yeah. So if they really know how much it's bothersome, it will make a difference. But also I have to warn you, don't go out there and make a list of 120 yeah. and say 10 out of 10 for no, everything. Only two. Only do two. Two at a time two at least. Two at a time at least. Okay. <laughs> Compassion. Compassion is being there for the other person mm -hmm. without making it about yourself. Yes. And uh, talk about 
the distinction between empathy and compassion because I really loved what you said about the difference sure. between. So empathy is feeling with the person. So let's say, for example, as humans, we relate with each other. Um, I say, oh, I have a bit of a cold. Your mind immediately goes to the last time you had cold, you were feeling that way. You're trying to get something that's joining, called joining in human relations, right? Mm -hmm. Healthy humans do that. Sometimes that becomes a little too much. I say, I have a cold. You're like, I'm sniffling, actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm coming down with mm -hmm. something. You hijacked my cold. And imagine what it does to couples. They come, they're tired, they're sad, they're angry at each other from something else or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. they're excited. And then before they know, it becomes the other person's thing mm -hmm. to feel, yeah. right? They haven't put up the boundaries per se of like, they, they just took in the feelings of the other with ingraining it themselves. Exactly. And that's, an, an, so compassion instead is, is understanding the feelings of your partner understanding the feelings of the person you're dealing with, but it not internalizing it. Right. So understanding actually is a little bit overrated, okay. if I may. Okay. Uh, and I learned that from the corporate life, because sometimes when I, I learned that sometimes, especially in humanitarian situations, when the board needs to admit to a budget, like agree over a budget that goes to a cause, People have so many, not only differing opinions, opposing opinions. Mm -hmm. They have zero understanding of each other. But at the end of the day, I walk out with a document with the funding. What does that tell you? They're working towards a shared vision. Mm -hmm. So for couples who are trying to understand one another, I've seen that that's a pitfall. If I may offer something here, compassion is I show up for you. And I have a little exercise around it. You come to share something with me and say, Sarah, um, I'm a little upset with you. You did something. You said something that actually bothered me today. Do you have a minute? And I just want you to listen. Can you hold mm -hmm. that for me? Mm -hmm. I know exactly what you're expecting. I know if you have a um, time frame around it, I even prefer that. Can I have five minutes? And five minutes, please don't go to five hours. Mm -hmm. Keep it at five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. And then... You know, when you said that this is really, you know, this was really bothersome. I just wanted you to know. And then I, if I'm empathic, I'm like, I could be defensive. I could be so sad and ashamed and embarrassed. like crawl under this seat or, you know, mm -hmm. disappear, whatever. That doesn't go well. Or I let your sadness regulate me and my nervous system. That's empathy, right? Mm -hmm. Over empathizing. But with compassion, I'm here. Oh, my God, this person is really hurt. And she wants me to hear her. Okay, do you need a hug at the end of when you are done? Can I hug you? Do you need mm -hmm. to talk more about this? Mm -hmm. Was this helpful for you to share with me? Is there anything I can do? That's compassion. It's not about me. Yeah. It's about you, even if I punched you and bruised right. you. I love that. Shared vision. Shared vision is all about commitment. Mm -hmm. You need to know where you're going. With shared vision, you need to talk about location. You need to talk about um, basic values that you bring to the system, whatever that is, from macro to micro and, yeah. you know, all of that. And uh, what is it that you're committing to when you don't feel like it? And how, how do you also have, when you have a different visions, different value systems, how do you align with it or how do you navigate that those two differences, I would, I would imagine. Some of them could be rectified with compassion. Okay. With, uh, some of them could be managed with mm -hmm. negotiation mm -hmm. and compromise. I don't recommend too many sacrifices because um, sacrifices don't go well over time. Mm -hmm. uh, if one person feels like they are sacrificing all the time or they are sacrificing without the reward in return that they were expecting, um, however way that they define it, um, they end up in not a very good situation. A lot of resentment I see in people. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, from organizations to bedroom to boardroom. So right? try not to sacrifice. Mm, at least be very, yeah. very clear. And also that is not your default, hopefully. Right. But also with shared vision, one of the things that is very important is that you have a vision for yourself. Because I see a lot of people, they don't have a vision. Their point of attraction is they are attracted to a person who is very decisive, very mm -hmm. articulate, very mm -hmm. charming and 
sometimes not with narcissistic injuries. And then they go in, they get enmeshed, and then over a period of years, they hate the person. Mm -hmm. Hello, it's not only about that person, it's also about you as a person back then in time. You didn't have a vision. You like to be a part of that vision. And now this is not working for you. Yeah. So being so, clear with what your vision is of yourself and where you want to go. Exactly. And when you're not feeling like it. So mm -hmm. the commitment has to stay, whether you feel like it or not. And the final ingredient that you talk about is loving behaviors. Yes. When I was writing the book, people asked me why loving behavior. The whole book is called Love by Design. Mm -hmm. Loving behavior for you in partnership, you should know. I'm sure you do. Um, there's a certain quality to be loving. Mm -hmm. It's tenderness through words, touch, all the five senses. The way we are yeah. occupying a space with one another. I go out of my way for my partner. I, I give them benefit of the doubt. I prioritize them with my resources, time, energy, attention, and money. So these are the things that make um, the loving partnership, add that component of mm -hmm. being loving to it. Mm -hmm. I love how in the book you talk about the difference between uh, what you consider a submergent love model yes. and an emergent love model. An emergent love is where one plus one equals three, Mm -hmm. And it's where each person is unique, a separate individual with separate their own separate thoughts, feelings, and desires. There is you, there is me, and then the third is there is we. And that is where one plus one equals three. Um, yes. Describe that a little bit more. How, how did you sure. come up? Tell me about the emergent love model. Sure. So the concept of the third is not the first time that we're talking about. There are lots mm -hmm. of colleagues and different mm -hmm. um, philosophers talked about it. So the third is the context. The third is the we, as you, you know, the coupled them. The couple them. But one of the things that I realized was um, in my meeting with one of the um, prominent voices in systems mm -hmm. thinking, Jamshid Qarachadaghi, uh, he explained it to me that love is an emergent entity. And that made so much sense to me. That was the beginning of the research. Mm -hmm. You talk about how emergent love is a collaborative effort. It is something that you build with your partner every single day. So it's just, it's constant development. It's constant, it's just working at it rather than just relying on what you call the mania of love, the bipolar aspect of it the romantic aspect of it, which is what a lot of pop, a lot of couples think of just what love is. Mm -hmm. It's it's while there's an element of that too, it's also the, just maintain it's clarifying expectations, listening, maintaining boundaries and building building the building blocks. Yes. So if you think about it, one plus one equals one, submergent mm -hmm. as I call it. Mm -hmm is when two people come together and originally heterosexual, like a cisgender coming together, spending a lot of time together, mm -hmm. becoming one, then we are in love, right? Mm -hmm. Then let's do what is the next step. These couples find it very difficult to deal with a lot in life because this leads to codependency. Mm -hmm. This leads uh, to um, a lack of self, basically, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot that we can talk about. But what we found through our research, asking people what makes your relationship thriving was submergent, uh, was uh, emergent love, meaning that one plus one equals three. Imagine a spark, mm -hmm. lug, coming together in a conducive context of oxygen and heat. What do you have? Fire. Fire. If you take one of them away for a second, what will happen? The fire dies. Yeah. So that is the difference. It's a concept that has not been discussed before. So people have a little bit of, um, what, what just happened? But really stay with me and think about it this way. The six ingredients that I'm discussing, mm -hmm. they need to be there all constantly. the time, constantly to create the atmosphere yeah. necessary and the elements necessary for the love, for that, for that, fire, that, fire, for that fire, dynamic fire yeah. to stay. And if one goes away, whether it's trust or whether it's loving behaviors or whether it's compassion, that emergent love, that fire mm -hmm. could very likely die. Exactly. And that's why people many times come see you. Exactly. Exactly. Your expertise as a therapist is uh, sex therapy. Yeah. Um, 
You mentioned in one of your uh, podcasts, previous podcasts, the difference between arousal and desire. Mm -hmm. Tell our audience a little bit what is the difference, because a lot of people, I think, are confused about what arousal versus desire is. Sure. I should first probably say that I don't do sex therapy in California. So um, I, I'm allowed with my license to do this outside. Mm -hmm. Here I do more consulting, so I can't really get deeper okay. you know, in this. However... Let's talk about arousal and um, desire. desire. Arousal is any sort of agitation to your nervous system. Mm -hmm. If you really think of arousal as that, it's like any agitation to your nervous system. That's why we have mm -hmm. the variety of ways that mm -hmm. people get aroused sexually, right? Mm -hmm. Traditionally speaking, many people thought uh, arousal is the man's erection, and that's it, period. Uh, no talk about the female body, no talk about yeah. anything else. But with desire, desire is that fuel, is that drive that you want to um, step in and do something. Mm -hmm. So that's desire, right? And arousal is the um, is is when your nervous is speaking about the body, when you um, when you feel like you are uh, working towards something. So the, if the desire is the draw then arousal is something that could be created based on that, or you could have arousal without the desire. Mm. If you are, especially for women now we know, or um, more and more research is needed for people who are not occupying a male or female, you know, binary model. Yeah. But from what we know now from the binary model is that uh, women specifically re uh, have responsive arousal yeah. system. So that uh, when you come, and also the desire comes too. So desire is, I want to do this. Right. Right? No, I mean, and I can totally relate as, you know, I, I, my boyfriend and I can have like a one, I can desire him incredibly, you know, strongly, but the, what you talk, the irritation, the physical irritation, the, the physical steps that need to happen to get to have arousal, the steps to actually, so that my body can physically respond mm -hmm is different than just having that mental desire. And I think that a lot of times, whether it's a man or a woman, it's like to get to that state of heightened arousal for to, to, to have sex, you have to have do certain things. The couple needs to do certain things to get that, to, to get to, exactly to create that fire, create that magic. Exactly. So I have a term for that. Mm -hmm. So if the sexual chemistry is just coming together, mm -hmm. having hot sex dangling mm -hmm. from chandelier, right? So the one that I'm introducing in the book is sexual harmony. There is a place in the couple them that uh, empathy works so well, mm -hmm. erotic empathy. Mm -hmm. erotic so you are empathy. actually touching each other at the nervous system level, really? at that regulation level. So when you are saying that I desire my partner, but I, it doesn't necessarily translate into the bodily mm -hmm. arousal. So there's a lot going on between the two bodies. So a lot of people, a lot of busy couples specifically, they forget to touch each other. That's why I talk about touch lexicon mm -hmm. in the book, mm -hmm. right? So they forget to touch each other. And then the only, the only point of connection is sex. Mm -hmm. I don't know this body. Why am I having sex with them? So right? how would you then describe the difference between sexual compatibility and sexual harmony? Sexual compatibility or chemistry? Se sexual chemistry. Sexual chemistry. Because that, that's different. I can, yes. I can go there. But So sexual chemistry is when you have this almost spontaneous uh, draw to someone. And I have people telling me um, that, um, well, you know, um, I have this thing that I want to be around this person and really have sex with them. I think sex is going to be so hot with them. Mm -hmm. She's not even my type. Mm -hmm. That's sexual chemistry. You can't really logically uh, describe it. Mm -hmm. And what we know based on, again, heterosexual, cisgender research, evolutionary based, um, it's based on being driven to a person so that you can have sex with them, create cute little babies who are genetically healthy mm -hmm. because, you know, that's that's the drive. Right. Yeah. Or sometimes. Um, your route of arousal is associated with certain smell, certain way that the person looks or feels that is culturally constructed. That could be a part of it too. But then on the other side of it with sexual harmony is learning and relearning each other. Mm -hmm. So you're actually spending time to deepen 
into me I see, into me you see. Mm -hmm. And then it's a constant dance and invitation with one another and embedded in the reality of your lives with the physical abilities, phase mm -hmm. of life, mm -hmm. hormonal changes, every good stuff that we go through in life. I remember reading in your research it said, just evolutionary sexual chemistry lasts for two years for because it's like first year to have the baby and then one year to take care of the baby and then after that mother nature kind of just says okay sexual chemistry is gone so if you want to maintain a relationship with someone building on that sexual harmony mm -hmm. is really important and that requires the work and sometimes when people say oh i don't have the desire for that person anymore the sex isn't what it used to be is that that's where we can really work on that sexual harmony piece of it. Yes, and they're chasing something that can't be restored. Yeah. That's why we really need to start speaking differently about all of these concepts, honestly. Um, one of the main reasons I wrote this book was I didn't want my son to go through the life that many people, many of my clients do. Mm -hmm. Honest to God, that was one of the reasons. And I was thinking if I was privileged enough to collect this information, people need to know. So, for example, when you're talking about the sexual harmony piece, it's a place that you go to experience that. But also it requires a lot of work and energy, yeah. right? And it's okay if your um, sex life is not that hot and, you know, whatever, because there are other aspects of life that come together and those points of attraction, different points of attraction, mm -hmm. right? They couple them. The other thing I want to say is, we are talking about long-term relationships here. So there's nothing wrong with people who want to have those hot experiences. Up to them, good for them. But our conversation is about people who are disconcerned, you know, disillusioned. Mm -hmm. They are feeling like they're chasing something that could never be. They're dealing with this grief, almost. And the research that you're quoting from book also is um, multiple research, but one of the ones that are very much known in the U.S. is specifically is my good colleague, Dr. Helen Fisher, that the research showed um, that the sexual chemistry, that infatuation will go away on average within two years. Yeah. How, for couples that want to maintain that high level of just sparks and fire and that the feeling that they had when they first were, the first two years, let's say, of their relationship over time, whether it's five years, 10 years, 20 years, mm. they want to maintain that heightened level how what love what advice would you give them in terms of the sexual harmony in terms of using the emergent emergent love model continuing to work on that every day to maintain that sense of just mystery and just the desire is there what what are there things that you would recommend to couples who to do that in turn on the sexual harmony component? Yes. First and foremost, make sure that your bodies like each other. Mm -hmm. If your partner goes around and shouts, yells, raises their voices, and you're scared, your body is scared of them, you know nothing bad is going to happen, but your body doesn't, then you're going to shy away. You're going to switch that off. So that's mm -hmm. one. Take care of yourself mm -hmm. in however way that yeah. you can. Yeah. It's important. And close that toilet door, please. Yes. Have, there, have, there needs some mystery. There needs mystery. to be a little mystery and there needs to just, they don't need to know everything about you. Yeah. And yeah. also, you know, another thing that I was actually speaking with BBC the other day about the snoring or mm -hmm. sleeping habits. Yeah. Look, I understand that this is scary, especially with this term that was used that I actually don't recommend using because it ruined the whole evidence behind this thing, you know? When you call sleeping separately, when you call sleeping separately for couples as sleep divorce or, you know, these negative connotations, obviously people think that if we sleep separately, even though you're snoring, even though you wake me all the time, even though it's yeah. horrible, you're kicking me, you're stealing my blanket, you know, whatever, and my body hates your body because of it, mm -hmm. but we have to keep at it. Otherwise, we yeah. are one of those sleep divorce couples. No, no look through the reality of your lives. And see what is it that if you come together 10 minutes before you go to bed, yeah. you have that heartfelt, maybe back-to-back -back breathing, mm -hmm. maybe eye gazing, mm -hmm. connecting with one another, and then kiss each other goodnight in however way that, you know, your thing is. And then you go to sleep, fresh in the morning, wake up, and then come, greet each other, come back together. But many people take it the other way. Yeah, they take it as, it's a per they take it personally or something like that. Yeah. Well, everyone... 
Dr. Sara says that you can sleep in separate rooms and still have a very healthy relationship. And that's actually great because it gives it having that space. You don't need to be with your cup as a, cu a couple all the time. Absolutely. But before you do that, make sure that you have a moment of physical connection with one another as best as you can. So you can't have a carte blanche just to go and say yeah. hello and goodbye. I'll see you yeah. tomorrow. And, you know, no, no, no touch. We don't do that. Right. So a moment of coming together and then having a conversation around this and going to sleep separately. As we wrap up, Dr. Sara, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of our guests sure. related to the concept of balance and achieving health, wealth, and happiness. What would you say are your top three healthiest habits? Meditation. Definitely meditation mm -hmm. for mental health. And um, what I learned over time is to respect my body. Mm -hmm. Basic needs, hunger, rest. Mm -hmm. Um, the lighting at my desk, yeah, um, just physical, physical comfort that we need. Taking breaks, yeah, rest is important. And I, I mean, so I find important. even as, I, as I'm getting older, at 44, I need a lot more naps mm -hmm. than I did when I was 24. Mm -hmm. It's and, and just so respecting your body is uh, respecting the limitations and taking breaks. I mean, that's such a such great advice. Yeah, because if we don't have this, we have no home. Yeah. Exactly. We can't give to anybody else if we're not taking care of ourselves. Yes. I have a principle that says part of balance is having healthy vices. Mm -hmm. And a healthy vice are things that are maybe not necessarily good for you, but that bring you great joy. For me, it's like poker. Poker is an example of a healthy vice. It's not good for me. You know, it's addicting, but it brings me great joy. What would you say are your top three healthy vices? Did you say healthy? Healthy, yes. They have to be healthy because it's a vice. It can be a vice. You know, it's a difference between eating, you know, ice cream versus uh, doing a line of coke. You know. Yeah. No. Not that. <laughs> I would say my vice, any number of them, would be my social connections, mm -hmm. my son, mm -hmm. just just being at his presence. I would say. How old is your son? Ten. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Beautiful age. And yeah, absolutely. My husband, my siblings, like uh, my parents, any kind of deep connection, my mm -hmm. friends, mm -hmm. uh, that would be that. And uh, on edible stuff, coffee. Mm. Coffee. You is drink my... a lot of coffee? Yes. Really? How late do you drink coffee? Uh, I try not to drink um, after four o'clock. Okay, I'll but... see. I, I can't do it afternoon. <laughs> oh. but, uh, but yeah, so you drink so coffee is what helps you just keep on going. It's kind of weird. I just love coffee. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I'm also careful uh, for it not to become the poison of choice. Yeah, because I don't want to just drag myself to be able to go. Right, mm -hmm. you need to be able to read the signals. Yeah, if you have to stop, you do. What are the small things you do every day to try to achieve balance? I try to bring multiple identities that I have on board. Mm -hmm. I try to make sure that they're doing okay, taken care of. And then, um, and then offer them into my roles, as we talked before. Um, I would say I pay close attention to my transitions. Mm. That's really important that for is. me for balance. So the inner balance and then transition mm -hmm. between one role to the other is very important. I think me. that. I mean, we could do a whole conversation about this. Yeah. I mean, I, I would love to invite you back to talk about <laughs> sure. some of those elements. Because, yes, the transition of how you transition from different roles yes. is so important. Um, I love that. What does wealth mean to you? Well, there are certain capitals, wealth and capital go hand in hand to me, for me, that we need to bank. I would say social capital, financial capital, to the point that I don't need somebody else. And if I want to be charitable, I can for the causes that I can, I, I want. So that's, um, and emotional wealth, uh, as a person who provides for people who is in the service yeah. industry, so to speak, uh, I need to make sure that I have enough wealth, uh, you know, my mental and emotional wealth to be able to be abundant and generous to other people. Yeah, that's important. So that's all, there's, you, you realize a lot of people may have financial wealth, but they have like, it, no emotional wealth at all. Yes. And also spiritual health. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, and wealth. Where do you get your 
um, sense of wonder where you get your sense of I'm a part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. That's wealth to me. What are the top three books that you recommend most often? Ooh, to whom? Uh, let's say to a client, to a couple. Let's just say to a couple. That, to a couple. Yeah. Uh, sexuality speaking, I like Emi uh, my friend's book, uh, Emily Nagoski's book, Come As You Are. Okay. It's a very good book to read. I think that's one of those like a baselines that people need to read. Um, a lot of um, Gottman's books, um, doc Dr. Gottman's books, uh, like the last one is Fighting Right is a good one. Uh, Eight Date mm -hmm. is a good one. Very organized and kind of mm -hmm. simple to follow. I would say that. And... Um, yeah, and um, Yes, Your Kid just came out by my colleague, uh, Dr. Devi uh, Herbenik, and it's on top of my my mind because a lot of parents that I see struggle to talk to their children about sex, and I think that's a good book for them. If you could have one message on a billboard that gives a message on what it takes to achieve the combination of health, wealth, and happiness, what would that message be? Ooh, um, I would say be intentional. That's great. Dr. Sarah, thank you so much uh, for being here with me today. Thank Is there you. anything else you would like to leave our viewers with? Thank you so much for having me and for all of these informed questions. I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. Thank I, you. I really enjoyed it too. Uh, where can our viewers find you on social media? I'm on Instagram under Dr. Nasserzadeh, and I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on YouTube, I'm on everywhere. But if they want uh, to receive resources, I highly recommend that people go to um, lovebydesignbook.com. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a resource page they can download, roles and goals, an exercise on social capital, for example. They're all there for them to download. Great. And also they can join the newsletter to receive any uh, further resources. The book is Love by Design, and you can also get, if you want to do a relationship panoramic inventory, which is basically a analysis, is it, of the relationship? Yes. Is that you can go to relationship-panoramic.com, and um, if you enter the coupon code MEGA, you will get 10% off your uh, your inventory report. So uh, the web, if you want to also get this book, sign, a signed copy of this book by Dr. Sarah, go to lovebydesignbook.com. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. Uh, Dr. Sarah, thank you so, so much. And to my fans, to my viewers, thank you for watching. Thank you for spending this hour with me and Dr. Sarah. I love you. I love you all. And until next time.